morning, everyone. My name is Judy Parr, and I'm a member of the adult education ministry here at Hope Church. I first met Stephanie Pangborn at a dementia education series, and there are several in this room who were also there. It was held at Hope College last September, and it was sponsored by Rest Haven in partnership with Hope College. And I think that Stephanie had a hand, she told me, uh, maybe a large hand, in making sure that that came to be. It was a two-day conference with the uh, first day, uh, Dr. Lewis Nykamp, Residency Program Director for Pine Rest, presented a lecture on brain health and cognitive aging. The next day, Stephanie Pangborn's friend, Mich Michael Verdi, uh, presented his documentary, Love is Listening, Dementia Without Loneliness. After this film, I met with Stephanie Pangborn, Associate Professor of Communication, who came to Hope College in 2020 after teaching for six years at Clemson University. She earned a BA in Visual Communication at Spring Arbor University, an MA in Communication from Western Michigan University, and a PhD in Communication from Ohio University. Her teaching interests include hospice care, Alzheimer's disease and related dementias, aging, and family communication. Today, the first of three sessions, she will begin to help us learn how to ease the dis-ease of dementia. Welcome, Stephanie Pangborn. <laughs> Thank you. There we go. A little better? Yes, much better. OK, good. Thank you for having me. I was explaining to Judy how special this is to me. Um, I'll introduce you in a little while to someone very important to me, um, who was a United Methodist pastor and hospice chaplain. Um, and he was my grandfather. And so walking into the sanctuary um, and seeing the beautiful stained glass windows and hearing the organ play, which is what my grandmother used to do at all the churches that he was a pastor. I, I just, I, I'm richly feeling his presence today. So this is special, especially on Palm Sunday. Um, this is um, my heart <laughs> um, that I'm sharing with you today. Um, this stuff is very personal to me, and I know for many of you it probably is also the same. And so um, I just want to invite you to think differently about, about a story that we've heard um, told in a very particular way, which has um, caused more social and emotional suffering than actually needs to be the case. Um, and so I'll invite you just for a moment into the theoretical side of, of my brain um, that helped me process a very, um, a very personal experience in, in a productive way, I'll say, okay? Um, can, are you going to do the slides? Is that how you want to work this? Or I can, there we go. Awesome, thank you. Okay, so today we're going to reframe dementia as a dis-ease instead of a disease. Uh, and that hyphen does a lot for us. Um, on April 7th, when we visit the week after Easter, we're going to watch um, a good portion of the documentary um, that Judy was referring to that we played over at, at Hope in September. Um, that was produced by my friend Michael Verde, who trained me as a memory bridge ambassador. Um, basically, it comes down to creative caring for individuals with um, cognitive decline. And then our final session together is admittedly my favorite, where we think about what it means to care in creative and compassionate ways. Um, and so we will hopefully have fun together talking about a difficult subject. Okay, so examining the dis-ease of dementia, the first thing before we can even talk about what dementia and cognitive decline is, is, um, is well-being. Okay, so I, I received my PhD in health communication, and in the past decade or so, a lot of people have said, well, what does that mean, right? A lot of people, um, rightly so, think of, I study interactions between doctors and patients. And that's where the field started quite a long time ago, and we've come very far, because it's not just doctors who care for people, right? 
Um, and so the way that I try to explain this, like I've gotten to the point where my four and six year old sons get this. <laughs> okay, so we experience our well being at multiple levels. And at each of these levels, communication plays a critical part. All right? So I explain well being and the experience of being well or not being well as one that's very personal one that's absolutely relational, and one that cannot escape the forces of our society and the messages that we're given before we ever learn to critically think about them, right? So in the case of dementia, there are particular stories that we're told in our society about what that is, right? or about what aging is. We live in an incredibly ageist society, right? And we think somehow that we are going to be able to escape this thing that um, is involved with being mortal, right? Which is death <laughs> and decline. Um, and those stories are told to us at a very young age and we carry those with us. We carry them with us into our relationships and we also internalize that, right? So that at 41, now I'm being fed on my social media channels my aging cream to get rid of my wrinkles, right? Like, because I am supposed to avoid everything associated with what our society has deemed decline. Um, so this is really deeply theoretical, and um, Judy has asked that I condense it so that we can have more time at the end to actually talk about this stuff. Um, but I just had to keep this here. There are entire courses I've taught <laughs> in the past um, 12 years about just the personal side of this, right? Or just the relational side. Um, and so if anyone wants to really have a conversation, let's get coffee, okay? Um, but I'll move forward for now. The other side of explaining um, what health communication for, what it is to me, is a very um, storied experience. I um, deeply studied narrative theory throughout my schooling, and I don't think I've ever written anything without citing my favorite scholars in narrative theory. The point of this is that human beings are essentially storytelling creatures, right? We want to, um, we seek coherence in our lives and meaning in our lives by attaching stories to them by implotting people and things that happen in a way that makes sense that we can live with. Um, and so there are a lot of people who have framed stories as significant to our well-being. One of my favorite writers of all time is Arthur Frank. He was a physician um, who also had personal health experiences, significant ones, and some of his most delicious books <laughs> are the ones that he wrote where he wrestles with what it means to care for people from the professional side and how he was forced to confront the very personal and relational experience of well-being once he became patient. And he details um, his experiences with his wife where she became caregiver informally while he was working as a paid professional caregiver. Um, but one of the quotes that is important to preface our, our next three Sundays together is human life depends on the stories we tell. The sense of self that those stories impart, the relationships constructed around shared stories, and the sense of purpose that stories propose and foreclose. And today what we're gonna talk about is the way that our stories and our well-being are foreclosed long before they need to be in the context of dementia, okay? Um, at this time, those of you who have the little stacks of white paper, I would love if you could pass those to your friends. Uh, when I was able to speak with HASP a month and a half ago, um, I invited everyone to just write down the particular part of their story that brought them here today. Um, wh what is your interest? Um, do you personally have cognitive decline or someone you love who's experiencing this or have you in your past? Or are you here just to learn some things? Um, it helped me really frame the second and third session to the group. 
So um, if, if you're comfortable, share whatever you're willing to um, about what you'd like to learn in the next few Sundays. Um, and I'll do my best to integrate all of those things um, in our conversation. Because from a narrative standpoint now, I get to be a potentially significant character <laughs> in your life and the way you're understanding this. And I want to do um, the best that I can to serve that. And feel free to continue writing on this as you have questions throughout. Um, questions are welcome on the paper, too. Okay. Um, Kenneth Burke is another writer um, that I've grown to really appreciate in understanding the communicative dimensions of our experiences as individuals and in relationships in our world. Um, what he teaches us in a lot of his writings is, is really that our life is a drama in and of itself, that the world is a drama, right? And it's fun to get to talk about this thing in the context of a church with people who believe in the greater story um, of our lives. We are born into a story that started long before us, right? And in some ways that's um, affirming and empowering, and in other ways that can be really limiting. Um, because we have this pre-existing story that comes before us, um, we are trained to think about things in life that happen to us, relationships we have, responsibilities we have, in a very particular way. It, it makes things easier for us, right? It's less work when we have a story we understand and can approach life experiences and relationships um, with some information behind us to drive our decisions. Um, the problem is, in being given particular perspectives, we also have trained in capacities, is the concept that Burke teaches us. Basically, the more I learn to think of something in this way, where I'm focused here, the less I think about all of the other opportunities or possibilities that exist beyond that particular lens that I'm trained into seeing, right? So it's important that we understand um, the limitations that come with our strengths, right? Sometimes we say often our greatest strengths are also our greatest weaknesses. Um, and this really comes to play here. Okay, dementia and cognitive decline. There are a whole host of conditions that we've grouped into this large neurodegenerative illnesses. Um, and it's, it's really convoluted and it gets confusing because a lot of the symptoms associated with each mirror one another. Um, and then it's also complicated by the fact that normal aging has some of these symptoms, okay? So I share this just, just to frame the importance of our society learning to talk about this <laughs> in more humanizing ways. Right now, the statistics aren't great. But when you look at our growing population of older adults, it actually gets quite frightening um, if we continue to look at dementia in the one way we've been taught it. So this year, there's 6.7 million individuals living with Alzheimer's in the United States. Alzheimer's disease comprises 60 to 70 percent of the illnesses associated with um, cognitive decline or neurodegenerative illnesses. So doing quick math, which actually took me a little longer than a few minutes, <laughs> um, if 10.7% 10 10 of the population is 65 years or older, 73% of those are diag um, diagnosed are 75 years or older, then we have approximately 10.3 million people living with some form of neurodegenerative um, illness right now. And those numbers are projected to at least double in the next 25 years or so. When you start thinking about why this is important beyond, we have a whole lot of people we need to start caring better for <laughs> is that there are several um, of these that are also genetically wired, right? So this topic is really important to me personally um, because I have a thick line of genetic um, 
default <laughs> to this happening to my father, to me, to my children. And I don't want any of us to experience Alzheimer's in the same fashion that my grandfather did. Because we can do better when we learn to get outside of our very individualistic society where we regard health as someone's personal and individual duty and start learning that there's some social responsibilities infused in um, health and well-being, right? So this is my grandpa. Grandpa Rule, Reverend Rule is how everyone else referred to him, and that's me. Throughout most of my childhood, that was my favorite position. The best naps of my life were on his lap. Um, but he, he really inspires everything I do at this point in both my personal and um, professional experiences. Um, like I said, he was a minister. He was a hospice chaplain for more than 30 years. Um, and in um, 2011, he died as a hospice patient who had Alzheimer's disease. I was um, in, the, in the midst and transition um, from my master's program to my PhD program when he was um, diagnosed and it was less than three years before he passed, okay? What really inspires a lot of my desire to think critically about those social discourses is that there is no reason my family shouldn't have pursued a diagnosis before we did. Except that this illness is stigmatized beyond belief and nobody wanted to hear the word. And years before he received his official diagnosis, many of us were pretty sure that's what was going on, okay? Um, he was living in a long-term care community, a continuing care community. Um, they had sold their house in Logansport, Indiana, um, where I have very fond memories. And um, because my grandfather was worried about my grandma's heart conditions and the, her level of care, they moved into this community and not long after, he is, he is the one that's diagnosed and, and needs particular care. Um, so this is um, a deeply personal one. Some of the lessons he taught me though, at this young age, I'm now just recognizing how profound they were. And one of those things that we'll get to in our third session together is he's also the guy that inspired my um, creativity and my imagination and my pursuit for imagining otherwise. Um, and we did that with crayons and big oversized Looney Tune coloring books on their woven rug in front of the fireplace for most of my childhood. Um, and so to think of the, the moral lessons that he taught me and then also these creative capacities that he nurtured within me um, I was able to combine both of those things throughout his illness journey, um, and we actually had delightful moments together, at ones that I can look back on now as significant, powerful um, moments in which not only was I caring well for him, but he was able to care well for me as I was the granddaughter of someone dying with this illness, right? Um, and a lot of the ways we've stigmatized this particular condition, um, we take the agency of really just about everything away from individuals who are diagnosed. They become the passive recipient of care, I'll put in quotes, <laughs> because we've medicalized the experience. We forget what it means to be human together when we're worried about safety and pills and all of this, right? And so we're gonna dig deeply within that um, together. So part of this is understanding really the biomedical dimension of this illness. Um, in my health comm courses, we talk a lot about the different ways we can look at health experiences. And one of the first ways, ones that I'm really grateful for, is the advances in, in science and medicine, right? It's, um, it's something I don't know that we, be able to live without at this point. They're wonderful, but they're also limiting if we only look at these experiences from these perspectives. From a biomedical standpoint, looking at um, dementias or cognitive decline, 
um, we conceive of the human body and the brain as having a normal state. And if anything makes us deviate from that, there's something wrong. There's a problem that we can define, and then we can try to fix it. It gets problematic, though, in any context of a life-limiting illness, an incurable disease, right? What if the problem that we've defined can't be fixed? Do we give up? Do we retreat? There are a lot of people who do um, in, in deep love and concern for individuals who are diagnosed with dementia. Um, there's this um, advanced grieving process, right? Where in separating ourselves from the individual, we can start to cope proactively with the loss that we're going to endure. And in doing that, we limit the meaningful interactions we can have, right? Um, and so in the context of dementia, I am really deeply committed to creative care because it's not just those 10.3 million people living with cognitive decline that are experiencing this. It's all of the people who love them, too. And that's, that's a lot of people. And the hardship in that, um, especially considering that a lot of these individuals are, are managing this um, illness journey from home before maybe they eventually go into um, an institutionalized care setting, the weight of caregiving, the time, the finances, the emotions, the physical drain, it can be really, really difficult, profoundly difficult. And so there's many different dimensions of suffering when we talk about one individual being diagnosed with dementia. When my grandfather was diagnosed, um, he, he had three other siblings. He was the fourth in his group of siblings um, to actually have Alzheimer's. The three before him had passed away. And when he told us um, that he had been diagnosed with Alzheimer's, he invited my father and mother and myself and my younger sister um, to come for just one of our regular Sunday visits at Grace Village. Um, and we sat in the community room around the circle table and he just, with no appropriate transition whatsoever, went from talking about nothing at all to, oh, by the way, I had this meeting with my doctor and I've been diagnosed with Alzheimer's and here's how it's gonna go. And he laid it out because he had lived it with his siblings for years. Um, and that's just kind of who my grandpa was, too. There was no beating around the bush about hard topics. Um, and I, I mean, I remember every green pattern in that wood table because I, my world froze. I kind of knew about this illness. I mean, I studied this stuff. Right? I was in my master's program, getting ready to pursue a PhD in health communication, and, and I just didn't know what to do. I didn't know enough to really know beyond um, these, these big statements that Grandpa made about what the next few five years might be, um, what that meant for me personally. I, I knew enough to know that the disease was stigmatized. I knew that I didn't want to be a part of stigmatizing or marginalizing him, but I really had nothing else to go on. And so what I did, as any young girl in an advanced degree might do, I went right to the computer and started researching. And um, what I found is this, the medicalized definitions I went to um, very reputable sources. I went to the Alzheimer's Foundation's website, right? These places where I felt like the information I was going to be giving would actually be helpful and, and legitimate. Um, and what I found is that dementias are irreversible, neurodegenerative disorders with no cure. The symptoms of the cognitive decline that individuals experience will worsen over time. Okay, really encouraged at this point. Um, impaired thinking, judgment, expression, orientation, and clarity. 
um, compromised ability to interact with people and their environments, mood and behavior changes. And the clouds just got darker and darker. So what possibility could exist beyond this? And I also inherited from my grandma, grandfather and grandma being pretty stubborn too. So even though I see this from multiple sources, I'm like, but there's got to be a way. So um, although everybody else was painting the picture in this way, I thought, what other you know, really um, legitimate sources of information could I find? And so I went to movies and television. <laughs> Like, what are the other stories out there? What, what, can, what might help me here? Um, anyone here familiar with On Golden Pond? Yay! My students are not, and I'm on a mission to change that. Um, this was a film I grew up with. Any rainy day was a reason to turn on the film in my household, and I loved it. Um, but here you have this couple, and most, uh, I've learned to actually really appreciate the wife's role in the film, the more I've studied this, um, but you have Norman, and there's one particular scene in this film that as a child I had to close my eyes to, and it's when he went out to pick strawberries, and everything became darker. And he didn't recognize the trees. And they, they did cool tricks in the filming, right, to, to kind of blur them out and make something beautiful turn like really dark and depressing and frightening. And the, the scene is 20, 30 seconds, but it feels like 20 or 30 minutes because you can feel the isolation and the fear at that moment that he's going through, OK? Um, another one's the notebook. Um, my younger sister loves Nicholas Sparks, and I don't. <laughs> He's a great writer, but this one I have just so many problems with um, because of the ways it teaches us to look at and focus on the loss associated with dementia. The entire film, you don't like it either? <laughs> the entire film, you just, I mean, it's... I don't know why people would choose to endure it, uh, but all you do is, is watch him try and try and try and connect with his wife, his love of his life. And there are glimpses of connection, but most of the movie focuses on how hard and depressing this journey is. Um, there was a, a TV series, I honestly don't know if it's still out, but Raising Hope. Um, okay, so the, the gist of the story here is that you've got Cloris Leachman's character has dementia, and she lives with her kids who have kids who have a kid. <laughs> so there's multiple generations here, and you know, I, I'm, I am what my grandfather was a United Methodist pastor, so the pastor joke thing is real in my life. I appreciate humor, even if it's like really silly in a stretch. But this one, the way they use humor to illustrate this illness, um, I watched a couple of episodes while my grandfather had dementia, and it made me so mad. Because my pain in my life and my family was slapstick comedy for others eating popcorn on their couch. And it didn't feel OK. Like, there's got to be something between incurable illness that worsens over time and something we laugh at, right, for framing this. So that's another way the illness was framed in the stories in my life. And I wasn't OK with that. So I did some more research. Who are real people who have lived with this illness? When did it first become talked about? And what I find is the letter that Ronald Reagan wrote to um, the American people when he had been diagnosed um, is, is when conversations socially really started to happen. And if you actually read the letter, it's interesting because he disassociates himself for it. He says he will be one of the Americans who lives with Alzheimer's, right, instead of I am living this right now. Um, but many of the dialogues um, around this are sad and depressing. Um, I happened upon, because I had access to a bunch of articles um, in my library at Western Michigan, there's an article 
written by a rhetorician whose grandfather was diagnosed with dementia, and it put her on a similar pursuit as the one I was living. And so what she did is she did an entire study on all of the news articles following this letter. And they are awful. Headlines from national reputable sources saying things like uh, the great communicator lives with the most feared illness. And then within the article, um, people, the authors saying things like, if it were me, I would have rather investigated suicide. Or Nancy's been living with the ghost of her husband for 10 years, right? Like these stories socially that have created our particular way of seeing cognitive decline, any form of dementia, is, is that it's horrible, that the person is gone long before they actually are, that they're a shadow of their former selves. Like you can think of all of these phrases you've probably heard. But as I sat there at my computer trying to make sense of the conversation I had with my grandfather and what I was reading in all of these different sources, trying to really make sense of what our family story would be, it wasn't, it wasn't okay. I couldn't live in a story in my family and be okay with myself after my grandpa passed if I looked at him as a shadow of who he used to be. If my grandpa in front of me was something other than the grandpa I cuddled on for my whole childhood and that colored with me on the floor, right? And I had medical professionals, the doctors and the nurses at his long-term care facility who provided great medical care when I would arrive, because I, I spent most of my master's in the first year of my PhD going back and forth to Grace Village every other weekend. Um, and I would arrive and they would say things like, don't get your hopes up, or he's not your grandpa today, right? Trying, I really think, trying to prepare me for what I was going to encounter. And the stubbornness inside of me was like, I'm going to show you, right? But I would go in there, and sometimes, um, sometimes my whole entire Saturday with Grandpa would be me sitting on the floor holding his hand, right? Um, that had a lot to do with how we've medicalized the experience, and most of the medicines that individuals are given are sedatives, right? And then we say they're no longer themselves. Well, neither am I when I'm given something like that, right? Um, so we have a lot of work to do. But there are more creative and compassionate ways to continue being in relationships with people we love who are living with cognitive decline. And I always say that they're not someone with dementia. They are living with an experience. And all of us are living with something. And we should not demean, dehumanize, right, anything. Um, if we're called into this world to love one another, <laughs> then no matter what the circumstance, even when it's hard, we should do everything we can to pursue it. But because of the particular story of our society, we've given ourselves permission to distance ourselves, to leave up care to the medical experts, right? And all along, we have millions of people suffering either as the person diagnosed or as the one trying to still care for them. Um, so we can do better. That's what I'm trying to say. So if I go back to my foundations of narrative theory, I get permission to think of narrative not just as I'm born into these stories and that's the end of it, right? But I'm born into these stories, but I'm also a person created in God's image who, because of that, is inherently an imaginer and a creator, right? And I have agency in how this story is going to play out for me. I can't change the fact that Grandpa has Alzheimer's. I can't change how quickly that his, uh, the end of his life is going to come. But I absolutely can be one of the people co-authoring what this experience feels like for him and our family. And if I have the courage to own that, 
it's life-changing for everyone involved, right? So one of the things in my efforts to connect with my grandpa, um, something actually he inspired, right, with my creativity and commitment to loving others, um, when the doctors and nurses who told me, he's not him, or that's not your grandpa in there, when they would witness him being allowed to be him fully, whatever the condition was that day, and me accepting that instead of pushing it away, the ways they started to interact with him changed. When my cousins, when my parents, when my aunts and uncles came to visit and they saw that, it made them crave it too. And because even though, I, I'm not gonna sugarcoat it, it was hard. But I do have like profoundly beautiful moments that now I get to recall about that experience with him. So um, we can use our ability as co-authors to change things. Um, Kenneth Burke also wrote about using communication and the resources we have, not just words that we speak, but um, music and art, right? Or um, the Bible, the number of times we sat down and, and read some of Grandpa's favorite passages because it was a part of him and it, it brought pieces of his soul present even when he was um, in some of the hardest stages, right? Like actually using my ability to communicate, communicate creatively is equipment for living if we're courageous enough to use it that way. Um, okay, so the dis-ease of dementia is what we're gonna wrap up with before we have um, our chat together and it will launch us into the film and, and then our final session. So the Memory Bridge organization is based out of Chicago. My friend Michael Verde is the one that founded it. His grandfather had Alzheimer's too. Um, and his mission is to um, address the social and emotional suffering that comprises this experience for all those involved. So one of the things that he wrote is that there's a difference between Alzheimer's disease and the disease of Alzheimer's. Alzheimer's disease is a biological condition. Remember the biomedical condition. Um, it occurs in the brain and it involves the death of brain cells. The dis-ease, hyphened, dis-ease of Alzheimer's, however, is the emotional isolation that many people with dementia and their loved ones experience when what we call normal communication breaks down. There's no way around it. Cognitive decline affects people's ability to put words together and sentences together. But never in the history of the world has that been a precondition for engaging in relationship, right? Before, I have a four and a six-year-old. Before they ever were close to speaking a word, we had profound connection by the way we lived and engaged with one another and no words were required, right? And so how do we connect with that again? It means that we get out of the biomedical framework. It means that we acknowledge that this story that preexisted us in our experience is there, right? We acknowledge that there will be times that are hard, there will be loss associated, but that doesn't mean that has to be the, the lenses you put on to look at this situation, right? So, if dementia is not a normal way of being, one of the things that causes anxiety um, and a lot of missteps in caring for people with dementia is that people that love them stay within our, our social rules that to be accepted you have to be acting normal. Because what happens a lot of times is caregivers will do everything they can to mask the fact that their loved one has this cognitive decline. Sometimes not telling family or friends that the diagnosis has happened. Or when they're out in public settings, answering questions for them, ordering for them, right? Doing anything we can to not bring attention to this thing that's not normal. It's our attempt to control. And We've been trained to do that, so it's not our fault. We need to be gracious with ourselves, <laughs> right? Um, 
But if we step outside of the need for everything to fit a normal way of being, then we get to engage in the present moment freely and authentically with one another. Even if grandpa can't recite the passages from the Bible anymore like he used to be able to, he, to me, still is a pastor, and he teaches me things about loving one another, right? Like, we can't take away the personhood. Being a person does not equate to having a memory. <laughs> and our society has done a really good job at trying to convince us that that's the case, right? Um, so not looking at dementia as a problem that you can fix, but rather it's one way of being human. And if we're going to have... 20 million people living with that condition in the near future, we need to be doing a much better job telling um, humanizing stories of what this illness is and teaching one another how to care for people. So if we get out of the biomedical standpoint, what we're invited to do is see health and well-being um, from the biopsychosocial lens. And this one I love because it acknowledges the biomedical. It says, yes, there's something going on in the brain, and I can't fix it, and hopefully my medical care team can address some of those issues and alleviate pain and suffering in that capacity. But by nature of loving someone, we should care about their psychological well-being. How are they feeling? What are their emotions like, right? The social. Are they still engaged in community? Am I still engaging with them, right? So, as Grandpa always said, two out of three ain't bad. <laughs> we actually do, in our desire to control things, we focus so much here, we miss out on a lot of opportunity. But if we look at health and well-being as consisting of all of these factors, we do have control of two-thirds of the situation. And it's how we treat and interact and talk with the people that we love who are diagnosed, okay? So, Memory Bridge says, although there's no cure for Alzheimer's, the disease of Alzheimer's can be healed. And it's each of us, by virtue of being human, um, we participate in the healing. We have the opportunity to participate in the healing. And so when we watch the film, when we get together next Sunday, or two Sundays from now, um, the documentary invites us to think about how we, um, how we look at a person with dementia, how we address the perceptions of relationship and the responsibilities that there are in that. Um, it really calls us to be human, to humanize an illness, and to commit to staying alongside a person. Um, one of the things I'd like to say before we open up for discussion um, that really empowered me to do things differently, um, there's the person who's cited as the mother of narrative medicine, um, Rita Sharon, talks about when um, someone's diagnosed with something, anything really, um, there's this immediate chasm in relationships, right? So one person's diagnosed. Let's say I'm diagnosed with something today. I'm over here. I'm the only person experiencing it in the way that I'm experiencing it. It can be isolating. It can be fear-inducing. I can feel stigmatized, right? I can feel like I've been ripped from my plan for my life, and now I've got to figure out where I'm going next. And even the people who love me dearly, right, exist on this side of a Grand Canyon. There's this deep chasm because I love this person. I hate that this happened, but I don't feel what they're feeling. I'm going through my experience of this, right? And in the context of dementia, the people who love and care for individuals who are diagnosed are overwhelmingly preoccupied with the future. What's going to happen when? How long do I have? Um, all, all of these questions that limit their capacity to actually connect right now in the present moment, which is where the other person is preoccupied. 
right? And so Rita Sharon says with narrative medicine, the only way to bridge this chasm is, is through stories. It's through me on this side trying really hard to understand what the person on that side is going through. Getting outside of my individual self, she says, entering into dialogic relations where I acknowledge that there's something profoundly different in the ways we're experiencing this thing. And it does require vulnerability on both ends, and that's just hard anyway, right? What I've learned through my experiences with my grandpa and then some of my own health experiences of recent is that the very best way to care for someone is to be willing to go down in those trenches and stay there and walk with them when it's hard. And when you do that, you get to experience all of the joys of the present moment right alongside them. It's when we just stay on our opposite sides and try to do everything we can without being together in the situation. So I acknowledge there's something profoundly hard and uniquely difficult about cognitive decline, but it doesn't mean that we don't have possibility for being together and creating meaningful moments. So there's a reason that it's so scary. It's because the picture has been painted that way for us. Um, but we will let that just be our entry into the weeks ahead. Um, and Judy has asked, I think you have microphones for folks if they have questions or things to there say. Microphones on both sides. Ah. You come and they put you to work. Of course. <laughs> so please raise your hand if you have a comment yeah. or question oh, and a yes, microphone will you. come to you. Be aware that we that. are recording these sessions mm -hmm. and uh, let's, let's have a conversation. Glad to collect your questions as well. Um, I, I've I've got a question um, about the, the the role of humor mm -hmm. in difficult situations because I have seen where y when you're in the middle of a really difficult situation, mm -hmm. humor can serve a a, um, a cathartic function. Yes. And it functions well. Yep. So um, could you comment a little more on mm -hmm. when that humor crosses the line <laughs> yes. into something inappropriate? What is it around that? that oh. A lot of us cope with anything difficult in life with humor. Yes. Right? And that's, that's very, very natural. Um, because my grandpa loved humor, our family was able to use that as a coping mechanism, a tool to continue being together, to, to decrease the anxiety in moments. Um, I think personally, I experienced, um, I understood this in a new way. So without getting into a bunch of details, both of my sons were born wildly premature. And I spent a lot of days in the NICU as a NICU mom. Um, so my oldest um, son, Palmer, was born two months early. And my youngest son, Hudson, was born three months early. Yeah. So collectively, I spent 86 days in the NICU. Now, luckily, we had the same neonatologist as the lead caregiver um, for both of my sons. I love and adore him and will forever. He was a person who loved humor. And he used to say some things that Nick would be like, that is inappropriate, <laughs> right? But, but he knew because we had this established relationship already, his name is Dr. Owning, shout out if you watch. Um, he, he knew me well enough. We had been in relationship well enough that he knew that I needed that as a coping mechanism. It was in his ability to see me and be present with me and know when it was appropriate, right? Um, to, to share some joke or something he saw on social media about how hard the NICU experience was or how other people just didn't understand it. And he could make me laugh in moments where I was in bad way, right? And I appreciated that. So we actually had a conversation about this one of the many nights in the NICU where he'd come to check in 
And um, he said, I really appreciate people who are wired like me, <laughs> who, who allow me to be humorous um, and rely on that as a way of caring, but not everyone does. And so he said, in the first couple weeks of caring for a family, he could gauge whether that was appropriate or not. And he knew how to read particular situations with particular people um, that in, in ways that invited humor or ways that did not. And so it wasn't the humor itself that was the coping mechanism. It was his efforts to know the people that he was trying to care for. Right, so it's one thing if I, as a person who loves humor, see someone for the first time and try to tell a joke that they just couldn't possibly receive as helpful. That's different than if I use that same joke with someone I've known for a few years and I know they'll appreciate, right? So in a lot of the research that's being done, it's not actually the humor itself, but it's the relationship in which the humor is used as a coping mechanism. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Let, let me take you, oh, it's Mark Hookman. Let me take you back to that moment you said your grandpa had the whole around family the table. around mm -hmm. the table. And I don't know how old you were, but, but you were um, shocked and mm -hmm. sort of could only stare at the table. Yeah. I don't think that needs to be that way. Mm -hmm. And it's because of, you know, you had bought into the story, like the yeah. story that's out there. But so I think you're on the right track. We need a new story. Mm -hmm. I, I don't think I would have been, I would have been more like, oh, yeah, grandpa's nearing the end of his life, of, of course. Mm -hmm. Whether a diag, and this is the thing, I don't know what the diagnosis, why that's so important. Just any normal old person yeah. starts to lose their mental acuity. And of course, Grandpa, we want to walk with you mm -hmm. for the rest of your life. Uh, and we, I would really appreciate my Grandpa getting us all together yeah. for, for that kind yeah. of thing. And he's, he's trying to teach you a new narrative. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't see why, why would we be so upset with a diagnosis? It's, it's a thing that's, whether you get it or not, it doesn't matter that much to me. It's just normal mm -hmm. life. Normal life. Yes, and, and yet so much of, at the time, I'm trying to think of how old I, I would have been. Early mid-20s, right? Um, part of this is like we grow up in a society where we wanna pretend we're the ones that nothing bad's ever gonna happen to, right? Um, I never, had had a reason. I, honestly, before my grandfather's diagnosis, I was unaware that he had siblings who had it. It wasn't something my family talked about. We don't talk about bad, hard things, right? Um, not just my family, but in society in, in general. So we have these particular health issues that we either call socially silenced, right? Like, I had, I had never thought really at all about the NICU until I was a mom in the NICU. And then in that instance, I'm like, why does no one understand what I'm going through? Well, it's because no one talks about this, right? So I think that's a big part of this. Um, and, and we need to, another part of it is um, individuals who are living with particular health conditions and cognitive decline is, is probably the one where we see this the most. Um, part of, the distancing that we do is that when we're encountering cognitive decline or human frailty or aging and all of the normal things associated with it, um, it makes us confront the fact that that could happen to us. And so it's hard to be in those places. Correct. <laughs> if we reframed it, it could be profoundly healthy for a lot of people. <laughs> is it on? Yes. Oh, it was on. Oh, um, I think the thing about Alzheimer's is that what I've heard about Alzheimer's is that you, that person will gradually disappear. Mm -hmm. And I know you're saying walk with them, mm -hmm. 
Um, but it's that diagnosis of Alzheimer's that is so awful because I think we know or we understand that we will lose that person before they die. Mm -hmm. You know, they won't remember us or yep. our children, maybe. Yep. And um, I think that's what's so shocking about that diagnosis, mm -hmm. for mm -hmm. me anyway. Yeah. Um, on, on that note, um, this came up well, on the third session. Sure, way ahead. On the third session, when I was with the HASP group, we talked a little bit about this. Um, we think of, first of all, we associate being human with having the capacity to remember things. Well, if that's the case, I'm already not human. <laughs> As a mom of young kids, I forget a lot. But if we could do away with that, it'd be wonderful. Um, we also have a tendency to think of memory as an individual thing, right? Like, Grandpa doesn't remember my name. If we start thinking about memory as a relational possession, right? All of my memories with Grandpa, the naps, the coloring on the floor, the going on hospice visits, all of the things that comprise my relationship with my grandpa. When grandpa gets Alzheimer's and can't remember them, they're not gone. I still have them. And if I still have those memories, then I should feel called to continue connecting with this person who I shared those memories with, whether he remembers them or not, right? But the word Alzheimer's, Right, we have so many stigmatized understandings of what that means that just hearing it or getting the diagnosis is something that changes everything. And just so you know, the average years that people live after diagnosis is eight years. So imagine getting diagnosed with dementia and being dismissed by everyone because you're already gone and then living for eight years, not engaged, left to be the shell of the former person you were. It's, it should really bother us. Mm -hmm. This isn't a sharply defined question. Sure. 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 This isn't a sharply defined question, but I want to pick up on Mark's comment about mm -hmm. the distinction between normal physical cognitive aging and serious cognitive impairment, mm -hmm. as such as you've been describing. This last week, the New York Times had a long article on Donald Trump's father's Alzheimer's disease. There's a lot of commentary from people on the left uh, diagnosing Donald Trump as in the early stages of dementia, and MAGA Republicans are seeing Joe Biden as senile. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm wondering, I, I'm not asking you to diagnose either of those people. <laughs> I, 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 that, that's not where my question is I going. I have personal opinion. Yeah, okay. <laughs> I, I'm, not, I'm not trying to push you to go yeah. there, but rather I'm wondering if you have reactions to people's diagnosing people from a distance. I'm wondering about how we draw the line between how we relate to people who have Alzheimer's disease mm. and people who are simply uh, experiencing diminished cognitive speed because of the normal process of aging. Yes. And how we, uh, so if there's some implications for what you're saying mm -hmm. for connecting to normal aging. Yeah. Anyway, I, I, that's not a well-defined question. But no, but there's so many ways we could take this. Um, first of all, if you need an example of our ageist society, looking at the discourses right now related to the political campaign is absolutely that. Um, I think too that our, we live in a time where everybody, um, wants to have something to say about other people and the way they live their lives and what's going on with them, but then we don't want anybody to get into our business, right? So there's, there's that really weird dichotomy. Um, you can see this also, I don't know if anyone followed, Kate Middleton, right? The nonsense of all of the theories of what was going on in her life and why she was hiding. Right, that she had to come forward and create a, a video for the world to understand that she had surgery and they found cancer. And like the fact that people were so hurtful and nosy <laughs> um, in, in ways that really dehumanized her family's experience, um, it's, it's the same thing. I can, 
like one of these people and not like the other, but I can care that they're able to live well whether they've got dementia or not, right? Um, and I think that we do something um, in the social discourses and when we politicize health-related um, experiences that it's, it just really harms everyone's understanding. Maybe one more, yes. Hi, just a, a quick comment as you're talking. I'm hearing some of the language that is familiar to me from the disability rights movement. Yes. So you're, you're talking about people with Alzheimer's. Mm -hmm. And in the disability rights movement, we, we always talk about person first language. Yes. You're a person first, and then there is whatever you're dealing with, mm -hmm. which is a normal part of life. Yes. And I'm wondering if you came across in some of your research some of that um, disability rights information and whether you connect that with Alzheimer's. Yeah, absolutely I do. Um, disability studies was part of my health um, communication studies at Ohio University. And there's no way to really understand um, it without, there's no way to understand cognitive decline and the personal, relational, and social implications therein without thinking about the dis disability rights movement. Um, when individuals have something that limits their normal way of, what the rest of us call normal way of being, we have coping mechanisms. We find ways to do it. We have a wheelchair, we have a walker, we have an assisted language device, right? Um, but in some ways, the rest of society is, is really good about saying, you don't fit the normal mode, and so you go here. Let's put you in this care home, and the rest of us are gonna do our thing and pretend like this problem doesn't exist, right? Like I love the school that my kids are in because it's their integrated classrooms, and my kids are friends with other children who have a variety of capacities, <laughs> right? A variety of abilities. Um, and things that challenge their daily living. And that's normal. And it, we need to look at being human as something that can be lived in a variety of ways. And I think the disability movement was probably the first that taught us that. So I'd love to talk with you more. Yes, Thank you. Ahead. Thank you. Thank mm -hmm. you for this Thank first you. session. Yeah. I'm that's wonderful. Mm -hmm. And yes, yep, if you have a note to add for Stephanie, please. Um, yep, we'll accumulate those quickly. Um, next week is Easter, and then Stephanie will be back for two sessions after that. But right now, um, I need to ask those who are able to please help us set up for Pizza Sunday. Um, and as you know, we have also presentation um, that'll be happening during Pizza Sunday as well. So we're gonna carefully move this screen up against this wall and then as usual we need three rows of five tables each just like we normally do with with eight chairs around each table so if you could help help us do that quickly that would be wonderful thank you very much